Heroes of the Pacific as a video game had a profound impact on my childhood, from sparking my interest in aviation to military history and also video games in general, there's a lot that I can trace back to this game. It's a shame then that in the age of remakes and remasters, this game isn't getting the attention it deserves. So let's take a look back at this weird historical arcade flight game and find out if my enjoyment of this game was purely due to nostalgia or if it actually got something going. With all that being said, what even is Heroes of the Pacific? Well, as mentioned earlier, it's a historical arcade flight game set in the Pacific Theater of the Second World War, hence the name. This game is kind of an old one, coming out around the same time as Ace Combat was in its heyday. Released in 2005, the game was available on PC, the original Xbox, as well as the PS2. I originally played it on the PS2 as a kid, but for this review I'll be playing the PC version. There aren't that many differences from what I can tell apart from the controls, but I'll get to that in the gameplay section. The targeting reticule is also a lot bigger on the console versions, but that's all I can find. It seems to me that the console version is pretty much the same as the PC version, save the performance probably. Also, for a game from 2005, I personally haven't ran into a lot of issues running it on my current gaming rig. I've played this game on at least four different computers of varying specs and for the most part I haven't ran into any problems there either. This is especially good since there isn't a modding community for this game. If there were any major issues with the PC port, the chances of a community patch being released is next to nothing. Normally, I'd go into a lot more depth about the game's background and development histories, you know, development struggles, issues, inspirations, all of that, but there really isn't a lot of info available out there about both the game and the devs. The studio behind the game, IR Gurus, eventually merged with a different company and became Transmission Games. Their history then abruptly stops right at 2009, and I can't really find anything else about them afterwards. It's like they disappeared from the face of the earth. Some sources say they shut down in 2009, but then a couple other sources give the studio partial credit for a game that's released in 2011. It's all very confusing. Heroes of the Pacific was released with both single player and multiplayer modes, though the multiplayer mode is long dead by this point. The game relied on GameSpy's multiplayer servers and that thing is deader than dinosaurs. The single player component is all that's left and it's not that bad of a deal for what you're getting. Presentation wise, the game has definitely aged, though it's hard to say whether or not it aged well or aged badly. Different kinds of flight games, after all, prioritize different kinds of things. Now this might be my bias sneaking in, but I don't think the game aged all that badly graphically. I mean, sure, the textures on the planes don't look all that impressive anymore and the landscape textures are a lot more basic than what we're used to these days, the console version of the game especially, but they're clear enough for us to understand the details, especially on the planes. The devs definitely prioritize their efforts on this end properly. The planes are more in your face than anything else, so it's wise to put more work into them than anything else. I mean, besides, you're gonna be zooming past all those low-poly tanks, jeeps, buildings, and trees at high speeds anyway. I think it's forgivable that they look relatively scuffed. What I think aged fantastically well though, graphically, is the menu and its art style. It's not much, but the art team put in a lot of effort into it and I love it. The menu takes after the style of old World War II era posters. It's all very charming and really sets the mood right. Everything from the main menu interface to the options menu, campaign mission selection, plane selection, even down to the loading screens. It's like the art team traveled back through time just to make these. It's amazing. I love it. More games should take after this philosophy of menu design. It, it just adds so much style and charm. And it's hard to put into words the reasons why I like it so much. 
compared to all the minimalist utilitarian blocky user interfaces we get today, this genuinely feels like a breath of fresh air. Now, unlike the visual end of the presentation spectrum, the audio side of things has aged a lot more gracefully, let's just say. The sound effects sound right and with all the different weapons being distinct and noticeable. The Zero's cannons are a hell of a lot bassier than the wing mounted machine guns of something like the Wildcat with the Mustang. Now, it's certainly not the best sounding playing game ever, even for its time, but it works and at the end of the day, that's what matters. The voice acting, on the other hand, it's... it's alright. Some of it's good, some of it's kind of... Uh, eh. I'm not quite sure who did the voice work for the Japanese characters. They're, they're, they're very hit or miss. Sometimes to the point of sounding like caricatures from those old war propaganda films. Since there's so little info about the devs and the development of the game, I'm not quite sure if this was supposed to be some kind of artistic choice. If it is, it didn't work too well, I think. Thankfully, you don't talk to the Japanese pilots all that much. There's pilot banter, sure, but not to the extent of Ace Combat or Project Wingman. What's really special, though, is the soundtrack. It's unfortunate that they're not titled properly, nor was it ever released separately. They're all just numbered tracks, and that's a damn shame. Because this actually bothers me a bit more than it should, because I like to list down the background music I use for my videos. And when I use soundtrack from Heroes of the Pacific, I can't source it properly. It frustrates me that good music like this can't be credited properly. Beyond the visual and audio presentation though, the gameplay is where the meat of the... <laughs> well, game is. You know, as you expect a game should be. Players familiar with arcade flight sims should already know what to expect even before taking off once. Flight systems are made for accessibility first and realism second. On a scale of Ace Combat to DCS World, where Ace Combat is simpler and DCS being more complicated, Heroes of the Pacific lands squarely with the Ace Combat crowd. You don't need to go to flight school to figure out how to fly planes here. On consoles and the gamepad, the controls are simple enough. Left stick for yaw and turn, right stick for throttle and roll. Fire controls are on the bumpers, while ADS and target tracking is on the triggers. Squadron commands are on the D-pad and the face buttons deal with target select and cycles through secondary weapons. Simple enough, easy to figure out. If first grader me can figure out, so can you. Now there is a separate gamepad scheme available that's supposed to be more realistic, but I've personally never used it. I don't know how well it works. And honestly, I'm too lazy to check it out. Now, on the mouse and keyboard section, things get a bit mm, complicated. By default, WASD is for pitch and turn, while IJKL is for throttle and roll. Squadron commands are on the numbers key, while weapons and targeting are scattered all across the keyboard. It kind of works, but it's also messy. Thankfully, you can rebind the controls to your heart's content. Though any input type that didn't exist before 2005 probably won't work. I highly suggest putting throttle and roll on the WASD keys, then pitch and turn on the mouse. The rest of the controls can be rebound to whatever buttons you feel comfortable. Personally speaking, it's a lot more comfortable for me like this, but don't be afraid to experiment with your own layouts. There's a free flight mode where you can test out and get comfy with the controls. Now, the only downside I personally see with putting pitch and turn on the mouse is that you have to contend with some nasty mouse acceleration. There's no option to get rid of it and it fucking sucks. Normally, I'd go and edit some INI files, but Heroes of the Pacific is using a game engine that I'm not familiar with at all. Give me a Unity, Source, or Unreal game and I'll probably figure out, but this thing is just too ancient for my zoomer brain, so I just have to live with it. Like I live with the pain of existence. Now, applying those controls to the planes is where things get pretty fun. There are like 36 different planes in the game, not yet counting the unlockable variants. Each plane performs differently enough from the others that you can't fly each plane identically to another. With different weapon loadouts, so each plane is going to have to tackle different objectives in different enough ways. Now, sure, both the Zero and the Wildcat are good dogfighting planes, but they fight differently. The Wildcat is a lot slower and less maneuverable than the Zero, but it has a hell of a lot more armor. It'll last longer in engagements than its Japanese counterpart, which will rely on turn and burn tactics. 
You unlock new planes as you progress through the campaign, and playing through the campaign once lets you replay missions using the Japanese planes you've unlocked. Moreover, there's 9 special planes you can unlock by finishing the campaign in Ace difficulty. There's no need to buy planes like in Ace Combat. Simply playing through the game once gets you most of what's available. The only thing you have to buy are the upgraded variants, which you unlock by spending upgrade points. You can gain upgrade points by finishing a mission on one of four difficulty levels. Now when you're flying, you're going to have to pay attention to what kind of plane you're flying. You've got four classes of planes, that being fighters, dive bombers, torpedo bombers, and heavy bombers. Each plane has different stats, being firepower, armor, speed, and agility. What they mean should be self-explanatory. Fighters are good for dogfighting thanks to their high firepower and their high maneuverability. But most upgraded variants have multi-role capabilities. This usually means secondary weapons like ground attack rockets or bombs. Now they probably won't be as good as dedicated dive bombers, but hey, they work. These planes are gonna be your bread and butter for most of the campaign since you are going to be engaging in a lot of multi-role missions. Now dive bombers are... Well, well, they're for dive bombing. It's, it's literally in the name. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what you're expecting here. You take the plane, you dive towards the enemy, and you drop the bomb. In terms of stats, they're generally a bit further under fighters when it comes to agility. Most of their firepower is focused on their bomb payload. You'll probably only ever use this when you're focused on taking out navy targets. You'll know that you're only hitting navy targets because the game will only let you choose between dive bombers or the next category of planes, which are torpedo bombers. They're dogship. This is completely historically accurate, by the way, at least on the American side. They're slow, they're not agile, and they hardly have any firepower. The optimal way to use them is to fly low and slow and hope your torpedo hits the moving target. If you're too fast or you're too slow, your torpedo drop fails. You have to wait for your torpedo to reload and restart your run if it does. Good luck doing that while taking hits from half a dozen zeros and getting shredded by enemy AA guns. Given the choice between dive bombers and torpedo bombers, I'd pick the dive bomber any day of the week. Torpedo bombers especially frustrate me on one specific campaign mission that I'll get into in a bit more detail later, because right now we have to talk about the last category of planes. Heavy bomber. They're hit or miss, depending on which one the game lets you use. Most heavy bomber missions lock you to a specific plane. If you're using the Catalina specifically, you're in for a snooze fest. If you get the Marauder or the Mitchell, it'll probably be kind of fun. The Marauder and the Mitchell are somewhat agile, relatively speaking, and are fast enough that you can do fun things. The Catalina, on the other hand, is slow, only has like one gun that you can use, and flies about as well as a brick. Not very fun. Thankfully, bomber missions are few and far between, which is great. Speaking of which, it's time to talk about the campaign. When it comes to playing the campaign, the game's mission variety is actually pretty good. There is a good mix between ground attack missions, air superiority missions, scouting missions, multi-role missions, escort missions, all that kind of stuff. On occasion, the game even throws something in the mix, like a stealth mission of all things. What really elevates the campaign from eh to pretty alright status is how they're contextualized. Being a historical flight game, all of the different missions you get are set in the backdrop of World War II and contextualized as a part of various military operations that took place around the time. Now I really love this. The game might do a lot of bending when it comes to its historicity, but personally speaking, being able to take part in some of the biggest name battles in the Pacific Theater from Pearl Harbor all the way to Iwo Jima. Now that is a major treat. Now, little Cheems definitely didn't appreciate the game enough as a kid. Now though, being a pretty big history buff, with a particular interest in aviation, naval warfare, as well as video games. Man, if I had to pick a list of my favorite games, this is going into that list. Now, like I said earlier, the game isn't very historically accurate. A lot of creative liberty was taken when it comes to how the missions portray certain historical events. This is especially so when the main character hops around between flying fighters, to dive bombers, to torpedo bombers, to heavy bombers as if it's nothing. Which isn't realistic, let alone historically accurate. I get that you want the players to have more variety in mission types, but it's still weird. 
Despite this, it rarely feels disrespectful or awful in any sense, if ever. Except for one mission specifically. Now brace yourselves here, because this next section is gonna fly dangerously close to rant territory. You can feel free to skip ahead if you don't want to listen to it, but here goes. In the mission that adapts the Battle of Midway, the player is locked to playing as a torpedo bomber and sinks one of the Japanese carriers with a torpedo. This is bullshit. First off, American torpedo bombers were total ass. Second off, American torpedoes were total ass. Third off, not a single torpedo fired in the Battle of Midway hit any of its target. I wish I am kidding, but I am not. Not a single Japanese carrier sunk on Midway was hit by a torpedo. It was American dive bombers that landed killing blows on each Japanese carrier involved. If the game was going to force the player into one class of plane for the Midway mission, it should have been the dive bomber. It's just so odd because this one mission is the only one that personally sticks out this way. Something else that's odd is the game's story. Oh yeah, there is a story in this game. It follows the exploits of one William Crow. He is a fictional Navy pilot who lost his brother at the attack on Pearl Harbor. He has this vendetta against the crack squadron of Japanese pilots who led the attack on Pearl and it's not really treated seriously or given the development it needs to work. The narrative in this story is very half-baked. Almost to the point that you can ignore it altogether and it wouldn't really make a difference. Most missions revolve around some adaptation of historical events and these are generally pretty good. A handful are pure historical fiction but are pretty cool so I'll let it slide. Then a handful try to incorporate the revenge side plot between the main character and the elite Japanese pilots and honestly feels like an afterthought meant to give the player some form of boss fight to cap off certain high stakes missions. Now, this isn't like Ace Combat where the character drama is a pivotal part of the game's narrative and is weaved deftly between missions. The revenge story between Crow and the elite pilots literally just pops up out of nowhere then leaves as abruptly as it enters. I get that the devs couldn't make Crow's personal story affect the world war, I mean that'd be kind of ridiculous, but it doesn't even affect himself. Before and after the encounter, nothing about Crow changes. Nothing about Crow's friends changes. Nothing about the Japanese aces changes. It's all, it's all stagnant. From the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor to the bloody siege of Iwo Jima, not a lick of character development happens for Crow. Even when he takes down the elite Japanese pilots he's had a hate boner for, for the entire war, it just doesn't affect him really all that much. If at all. Like at that point, why even have this side plot at all? Ditch the main character entirely and just have a silent protagonist without the personal revenge story. Give us another faceless pilot that the player can insert themselves into, just like Ace Combat, just like Project Wingman. This is especially frustrating because it's really the only major flaw I can find with the campaign. I can look past the historical inaccuracies and the Hollywood-style adaptation of certain battles so long as it's not disrespectful and so long as it's fun. The revenge story interrupting and interjecting itself into an otherwise fine historical campaign is just dumb. Now imagine you're chilling on your couch, you're watching the TV, you're watching like, I don't know, greatest tank battles of history or something. But for some reason, every 10 to 15 minutes, the documentary cuts to scenes from Nazis at the center of the earth. I mean, wouldn't you say that's jarring? I'd say that's jarring, and that's exactly how it feels whenever the revenge side story pops up in this game. Just let me skip all of this boarfest and just get back to shooting down Jap pilots because, surprise, surprise! The historical arcade flight game shines best when it focuses on being a historical arcade flight game. So all in all, if you like flight games and you're looking for something that scratches that World War II itch, then Heroes of the Pacific is something worth checking. Yeah, Jim? What do you mean they can't? Jeez, why didn't you tell me earlier? What even is the point of the video then? That's fucking stupid. No, 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 I'll figure something out. I'll figure something out. Yeah, so the game, the game's kind of not on sale anymore. Anywhere. At all. Hell, it's not even on GOG, which is a damn shame. It's not the best game around, but it's 
still pretty good, so unless you're willing to pay extra to get a legal copy, you're kinda shit out of luck. Now fortunately I do have a copy of the game's PC installer somewhere on my computer. I'll have it uploaded to the internet and I'll leave a link to it either on the pinned comment or in the description, or bar those two I'll have a Twitter post with a link to it. Feel free to use it. Transmission games aren't around to do anything to me, and both Ubisoft and Codemasters are going to have to fight over who gets to take this video down. Now, to my knowledge, there has never been a digital release, and the discs have long since ran out of production. The game is abandonware. Nobody is losing any money from me sharing the game to be enjoyed by more people. Though, if I do get a formal complaint, I'll probably take the link down. Anyways, I'm just about done with this video. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, share, and all that good stuff. This has been Teams of Regret, wishing you all good luck and Godspeed. Bomber Signing in.